Today, I'm speaking with Nancy O'Brien Simpson. Nancy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I really appreciate you joining me and uh, going through your story today with me. Nancy is the mother of five kids. Wow, you have a busier house than I do. <laughs> are they all grown, by the way? Or are they still living? They are all grown, yep. Okay. And you're from Cincinnati. And you are a retired forensic psychotherapist. That is amazing to even think about what that must be like. Before I go in with the, with the bio, can, can you tell me what is a re, what does a forensic psychotherapist do? I worked in uh, the prison system with felons mm -hmm. and I ran a program that was, um, it was a diversion program. Uh, it ran six months and it was amazing. In our prison, there were 250 felons and it was populated by a staff of true believers in the humanity and the ability for human beings to recalibrate. They were, the staff was incredible. And the men, it was kind of almost a reparenting program where we taught respect, we taught love, we taught, we just taught them how things that they should have learned in kindergarten and from their parents, but they didn't. Hmm. And this was the most amazing thing about my prison journey. I was there a decade. And I would say one sixth of every man who left us cried, mm. not that they wanted to, you know, stay, but that they cried because for one time in their life, they were unconditionally loved, not for the money they could give someone or the drugs or what they were loved just because, and it was so nurturing. They, these grown men, these gangsters and thugs they actually cried when they left us hmm, that's amazing what a great, great way to help people get back on their feet and that was for the ohio prison system and yeah. you also eventually went into writing you, you did some geopolitical writing and including was it correct a russian newspaper yeah pravda wow what what was the writing all about geopolitics it was about um war it was about peace it was about united states presidents it was about uh negotiations between countries hmm. amazing stuff and do you still write at all for anybody i not as i i used to really crank it out the articles i think i wrote maybe 52 for them all together but recently um i just took a break yeah sounds yeah. good and Wanted to just mention one other thing here that uh, we're going to get into, so we're not going to go too too deep into it at the moment. But you actually used to be a staff writer at Jerry Falwell's Moral Majority newspaper called the Liberty Report. Is that correct? That is correct. I was their women's columnist. Hmm. Did you ever meet Jerry Falwell directly? Yes, absolutely. He hmm. actually came to Cincinnati just to see me and to march in a picket line uh, at an abortion clinic to hmm. be with me right at my side. Interesting. My dad actually um, be, used to work for Jerry Falwell for the uh, bus ministry he had. He used to go around and pick people up to come to the church. So it was really interesting. Well, we'll get into some more of that in a minute, but uh, before we go into anything serious, what else uh, would you like to tell us about yourself? What else do you do with your free time? I would like to tell you that I am probably one of the happiest, most grateful people you will ever run into because I literally celebrate life. Every morning I wake up and I'm just so blessed and happy to be here. I am a reader. I adore reading, read about a book a week and I play the piano and I love to entertain. And I just, I'm a girl who loves life. Mm, that's awesome, that's awesome. What are your favorite kind of piano songs to play? Right now I'm doing Georgia on my mind and I like slow bluesy ballads. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. Well, that's that's really neat. I um I love as always to ask people at this point to tell us a little bit more about your background, especially regarding religion, uh, like what uh, you know what you were taught about the Bible, about Jesus, about God, about heaven and hell, all that, whatever comes to mind. So feel free to you know dive into that and take it wherever you want. I'll probably jump in a little bit to ask some clarifying questions, but I'd love to just hear your where you're coming from. So my father was. Uh, Jew, Jewish, and he was um, of Russian descent. Uh, not that he was born there, but that was his 
line. Was he an orth people. Orthodox Jew? No, they were very secular. Okay. His family was very secular. And he married a beautiful German Lutheran, my mother. And because my dad was secular, my mother, uh, my mother got the role of being the religious mentor. And she took us to Sunday school every single Sunday of my little life. Mm. And I loved Jesus in my Sunday school. And I can remember I was in kindergarten. And I, I don't know why this memory just haunts me, but I was in kindergarten and I went in the backyard and the stars were out in the sky. And I looked up and I said, what do you want of me? Like, what is it all about? I can remember doing that. And another memory back from when I was a little girl was I always had this fascination and fear of hell. I did mm. not want to go there. And although Lutherans aren't Baptists, they're not Pentecostal, they're not uh, fundamentalist hell oriented, I definitely knew Jesus came to save us from hell. And I didn't want to go there. And in my young mind, I remember thinking, it's probably going to be a 50-50 deal. 50% 50 of the people will end up in hell. 50 will end up in heaven. Now, this is in second and third grade. I'm thinking this. And I thought, all I have to do is be better than the lowest 50%, and I'll get there. And I know it's how children think. but And I always kind of thought that I would probably go, not because I believed in Jesus, but because I was probably better than 50% of the other people. Mm -hmm. And so I just grew up with this nebulous, the Lutherans were, how do I, they were not, although my mother believed in Jesus with all of her heart, as did her mother, my grandmother and my aunts, they all are Jesus lovers, but it wasn't like the Baptists or the Pentecostals. It, it, it didn't permeate everything they did. They just went to church on Sunday and believed in Jesus. When I was about 23 years old, I was married. I had moved, graduated college, Marquette University. I had moved to Kansas City with my husband who had gotten a job in Kansas City, Missouri. And we met and down there was more Bible Belt. And I should tell you that because my father was a doctor and he was a professor at universities in the biomedical department, and um, I never really ran, and we lived in the North in Chicago and Milwaukee and Philadelphia, I never ran into a born again Christian. I never ran into a Tim. I never ran into a fundamentalist somebody that was saved. I never in my life met them. I just met Catholics and people like me. Mm -hmm. So I'm at a party and I'm in St. Louis and a, a woman named Sherry Hine came up to me and said, are you born again? And I went, born again? And she said, you know, born again, are you, um, are you a Christian? And I said, oh, I was born a Lutheran. Yes, I was born a Lutheran. And she goes, no, no, no. I mean, are you like saved? And I said, I was born a Lutheran and I am a Christian. I, we weren't communicating. I didn't know what she was trying to tell me. However, there was something about Sherry Hine. Her eyes sparkled. She talked about Jesus. She obviously had something I didn't have. And I wanted it. I wanted this sureness of soul that she had because I felt that there was this void that Sherry Hine had that I didn't. So I said, Sherry, how do you how, how, how do you get saved? And she said, you ask Jesus into your heart and then you start telling people about him and making disciples and you read the Bible. So I started um, reading the Bible. I asked Jesus to come into my heart and I started telling people that I loved Jesus. And 
nothing happened. I didn't turn into a Sherry Hine. And I, I was trying, but I didn't. We moved from Kansas City to Virginia Beach, and I started seeing bumper stickers on a lot of cars that said Rock Church, Rock Church. So I decided that I would go to this Rock Church. When I went there, they were having a revival, and the revival, the, the time, it was a mega church back then, maybe a thousand people. I was in the back. It was a charismatic slash Pentecostal church, and I'm in the back, and this particular um, uh, sermon or, or Sunday that I hit was all about repentance. And that was one thing that Sherry Hine had not told me about, that you need to repent. Hmm. So this was you, all about... Just for, for anyone that doesn't know that word, what does repent mean? It means turn from your sins. It's not enough just to be sorry for your sins and ask for the blood of Jesus to cover you for your sins. You actually need to turn from your sins. Hmm. Now, I had asked Jesus to forgive me. I was reading the Bible, but I still had sins that I wasn't struggling with. I was just kind of asking forgiveness for them, um, which was kind of like a reflection of my Lutheran life, where you just live your life, but you believe in and love Jesus. So um, at that um, church, for the first time, I saw an altar call. If you want to repent, if you want to turn your life over to Jesus, then now is the time. This is a crossroads for you if you have not done that. One way leads to perdition, the other way leads to heaven. And in that moment, I said, Jesus, I really don't want to lead my own life anymore. I don't want to sin. I want you to come in and live your life through me. Now, something did happen to me. And I cannot deny that something did happen to me. And I felt like a different person. I felt that I, under, I understood what Sherry was talking about. And um, I became a rabid, energetic Christian who not only read the Bible, but I got people saved. And I started a pro-life movement that gathered momentum and landed me on the front page of our Cincinnati Inquirer with a color picture because we had moved to Cincinnati after that color picture front page of my family, anti-abortion forces take over the city. Jerry Falwell noticed my, or uh, I forget his name now, but it was one of his top people, um, noticed my writing somewhere and contacted me, asked me if I would like to start writing for Jerry Falwell, which I did. Jerry Falwell came to Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, marched on the picket line with me. It was very heady stuff at mm. the time. So everything's wonderful. I'm just percolating along this little Christian girl with my little Christian children going to a Baptist church. Everything is just wonderful. And I'm sitting in the Baptist church. And I would like to say this is maybe... 10 years after I got saved and 10 years of leading a pro-life movement, writing for Jerry Falwell, being the real deal. I mean, if there was a Christian, I was the real deal. Sometimes people who believe in once saved, always saved, will look at people like me and say, you were never really saved or I was really saved. Everybody, Christians out there, I was the real deal. I was really saved. So um, what happened was the pastor at this Baptist church started talking about hell. And he said, if you don't talk to your neighbor, the cashier, the mailman, 
and they don't hear about the saving gospel of Jesus Christ and they end up in hell. The blood is on your head. And I'm like, the blood is on my head. Oh my gosh. Like I'm kind of responsible for them going to hell because I did not tell them about Jesus. So I'm like to the cashier, do you love Jesus? Do the man, you know, and I'm laying in my bed and I'm thinking, how could God send somebody to hell? Because I was such an idiot that I didn't talk to them. That's not fair. It's not fair. They go to hell because I was an idiot. And then I started thinking about my children. And I started thinking about if they were like really, really bad, like they killed somebody, would I put them in a napalm pit filled with napalm and light it up and for all eternity have them burn because they did a bad thing? And I started thinking, I would never want anything bad to happen to my babies, ever. And then I started thinking, how could a loving father, a father, send his babies to hell, light them up, and burn them, and hear their screams for all eternity? Not a day, not a week, not a month, all eternity. They're going to burn in sadistic torture. And, and I, you, would, you would struggle with that when you were little too, right? A little well, bit. I didn't struggle with it. Back when I was little, I just hoped I was in the 50%. Right. right but, okay. but, but now I'm struggling. Hmm. And Tim, initially in my struggle, I of course believed it was Satan that was causing this struggle that was trying to rob me of my faith and that I was in this battle of good and evil and that Satan kept interjecting into my mind that a good Nancy, a good God would never send his children to, you know, it was I felt that it was a, a, a battle between dark and light. And so I would try and, but the more I tried to push it out of my mind, the more it just kind of stuck. Yeah. If we could take a second, I'd like to focus on what you just said for a second, because that is so critical. The idea that that you as a person can question things is a, is a big issue for a lot of people in the sense of they, they, they can't cross that bridge very easily. It's not even about a particular topic always, whether it's hell or canonicity or, um, you know, the, the, the idea of, of what did Jesus's blood do, all kinds of sub issues we could look at. But just the ability to say, I'm questioning the narrative. And like you said, sometimes your your training ends up coming into, into play and it just says, if I am questioning this, it can't be God because God's obviously not going to question himself. And I shouldn't be questioning him because he's the judge. He's obviously much, much wiser than I am. And if I understood his his white hot holiness, I wouldn't question his his wrath, his his punishment of people. So the only place that these questions could be coming from is from the devil, or I'm just from my own fleshliness, my own lack of trust in God. And you end up in a spot where you're kind of like doubting Thomas, where you're like, I I, can't, I just can't accept this. And then the Bible and the and the pastor comes along and says. No, no, you, you, you need to accept this is, this is the truth. And if you don't, if you keep questioning this, you, you have a problem, like you have a real problem. Do you, did you ever ha face anyone later down the line who, who had a similar question, maybe not necessarily about hell, but just anyone that was clearly saying, you know, something's wrong here. Something's not fitting right. But I feel like I just. I should just bow my knee. Like, did you get that sense that, that other people were struggling with the same thing where they're saying, asking, putting myself in the place of judge, uh, you know, God is clearly the judge. My, my role is to repent, like you said, and to bow my knee. But to say when you be become skeptical, where, where skepticism and doubt becomes the virtue as opposed to faith being the virtue, that people just, 
they, they can't deal with it without really going through some rigmarole in their, in their minds because they're so used to just saying, yes, sir, to God, yes, sir, whatever you say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And to say, actually, no, sir, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to take the party line anymore. It's so difficult for us. And why do you think that, like, in terms of the brainwashing that we get, why do you think it's so difficult for us to question the party line of Christianity? It's the zeitgeist. It's in our DNA. The Jesuits say, give me a child from zero to seven, and I will always have that child. They, they, and there's some truth to that, that mm. you, it gets into your consciousness as a child, into your DNA. When I talk to people about Christians, about hell, which I do often, one, number one, most Christians in mainline churches, and even many, in, surprisingly, in Baptist-ish churches, when they don't really believe in hell anymore. They just, they have a kind of new age, baptist -y, God is good, God is love, and they go, oh, I don't think about that. He would not do that. That's the response that I get. Very few people have ever defended hell to me. I can think of only two. Most people glaze over it. They love the idea of loving Jesus. And that's all they want to hold on to. They And here's the, the thing that, that um, atheists and agnostics struggle with is that Christianity is a touch point of community that we don't have. You get married in the church. You baptize your child in the church. You um, are buried in the church. You celebrate your 50th anniversary in the church. For agnostics, we have to recreate a new community somehow. And so people hang on to Christianity or the remnants of what used to be Christianity and has morphed into a feel good, love Jesus kind of religion because of the community. Hmm. So um, I, I'm struggling, the devil's trying to get me, and I'm now in graduate school, getting my graduate degree. And um, in class, and this is in 1996, and in class, there is this kind of old hippie guy, and he's got longish hair and tattoos and wears a leather jacket and has a swag. And one time I was walking in the hall and I heard him say that he, he said, I used to be a born again Christian. And I was like, you? are you kidding? Like, I'm thinking in my mind, he doesn't look like a born again Christian. He had earring and just didn't look like one. So I was dying to talk to him. And at this point, I'm still a Christian. And um, so one time I caught him before class and I said, I heard you say that you were a born again Christian. Like, were you a real Christian or just kind of a Christian? And he looked me right in the eye, Tim, and he said, I was the real deal. I went to uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, and I was a pastor of a Southern Baptist church. I said, oh, my gosh, you were the real deal. He said, yep. I said, what happened? Like, you're not anymore? And he goes, no, I'm not. I said, what happened? He said, I was preaching one... For those of you who are listening, Baptists believe in something called eternal salvation. Once saved, always saved. Once you ask Jesus into your heart, no matter what happens after that, you are going to heaven. So he said, I was preaching about once saved, always saved, and how important that salvation is, asking Jesus into your heart. And he said, I realized that life is a journey. It's not a one laser focus point of asking Jesus in. It's a journey. And he said, then I started, I was doing a sermon on hell. And I started thinking, how can God send good people, kind people, loving people who happen to be Muslim or Hindu or 
or um, agnostic, how, agnostic how, how can he burn them for all eternity? And he said, and I started struggling thinking that the devil was messing with my faith. He said, I could not get the devil out of my mind. I couldn't get the doubt out of my mind. And he looked at me and he said, the only thing that made it better was alcohol. He said, I found that when I drank, I would, the, the voices of the devil would go away. And he said, after two years, I found myself without a church, without a wife, without my children in our big Washington Park downtown underneath a bench. And he said, for two years, I was a drunk in the park. And during that time, he said, I learned that the people who really love Jesus aren't in the churches necessarily. They're the people that loved people like me. And I started crying when he said it. And remember, I'm still a Christian at the time, but I have goosebumps now because it deeply impacted me what he said. And then he said to mm. me, I learned that God is not a religion, that God is love. And his words were just so powerful. God is not a religion. God is love. Now, this comes on the heels of, I was getting a divorce and um, from my husband. And we had together led this huge pro-life movement in Cincinnati. I would say there was like maybe every single week, a hundred picketers or more at Planned Parenthood every Saturday, that many. When my husband and I got the divorce, all of my roles in the pro-life movement that I had created were taken away from me. I had this huge hotline that politicians, Newt Gingrich and uh, people of uh, Ken Blackwell, a big one in our state, Ken Marilicina, people were on this hotline and it, it was constant, constant. We had to get a second line. It was taken away from me. My speaking engagements were taken away from me. And because um, of the divorce, you're saying? Yep, because of the divorce, taken just, away, stripped away. Just for anyone that might not be as familiar with why that's so important, what would you say is the rationale behind that for Christian ministries or churches as to why people that get divorced have to step down? Like, what's the thinking there? I was a failure. I, w I was a failure. I was stained. Um, there was something had to be wrong with me that I got a divorce. I had to be somehow at fault. Maybe I didn't pray enough. I wasn't righteous enough. I wasn't submissive enough. Obviously, I had done something wrong to find myself no longer a holistic, happy, healthy family. I was divorced. Hmm. What sin had I done to find myself in this sinful position of divorce? Mm -hmm. I am at Planned Parenthood. There are a hundred people on the sidewalk in Cincinnati. Our Planned Parenthood has a huge 10 foot tall iron fence all the way around it to keep us out and to protect the people that are driving into their parking lot behind the building. During this time, two, three years that we had been picketing, they had escorts that would help girls who parked on the street to get into the building. And um, these escorts protected the building. And it's interesting because there was a symbiotic relationship between the picketers and the escorts. We never talked to them other than, you're killing babies, you're going to go to hell, 
you can't, you know, there was that, they never yelled back at us, but we somehow came to know them just symbiotically. We knew their names, we knew where they worked, we just knew who they were. So um, we were down, I was down at the picket line. My husband had moved to another state. So I was left with five children. At the time, my children were two, four, six, eight, and like 12. I, we had moved to Cincinnati within the last couple of years. I had no family here. I had no close friends here. It was me with five children, which was uh, with no support. It was, there's no way to tell you how intense that time in life was. It was so just some I've young got, ages too for kids. That's overwhelming it, at that age. It was completely, I couldn't go to the grocery store with these five. I couldn't do anything. It was literally, and no support. If you have a mom, sister, best friends, you could do it. But I had none of that. And that was before the days of, you know, where you can do the grocery pickup, where you can just order right. the line and go pick it up. It was, it was very different back then. Right. So um, I am... So I'm standing there with these, trying to keep the five kids in tow, completely overwhelmed, just completely overwhelmed. And um, one of the escorts, Ellen White, a nurse, an RN, came out of the gate into a crowd of 100 people, which never happens. Everybody's like kind of shocked, very quiet. And they wore these bright orange vests. So here she is in her bright orange vest and she's walking through the crowd. And Tim, she walks over to me and I'm like, what is happening? She then puts her arm around me and I'm like, what is happening? And she says to me, Nancy, we heard that you and Mike got a divorce. We heard that he's moved. And this always tears me up. She goes, and here is my phone number in case you ever need some help. Now, I, at that moment, it was, I would call it like when the man told me God is not a religion, he is love. This was like that. It was my second earth shattering epiphany because at that moment, the new head of the pro-life movement in Cincinnati came over to me and she said, what are you doing with her arm around you? If you want to hang out with them, Nancy, then just don't come down here. And it was like, the devil is loving me. The devil says he wants to help me. And the Christians, God is hating me. And I didn't understand it. The devil is showing me love and the Christians are showing me hate. So I was driving down the road to my house and I was just, I don't understand. I don't understand. And after that, 1996, very slowly, because when you're really a Christian, to leave it is no small matter. When you're really a Christian, to turn your back on something that has been your soul, your life, your reason for breathing, to leave it is no small matter. And after maybe like three years of the sermons no longer making sense, this God that of love that's pure hate and ego worship me or else I'm going to burn you for all eternity and never let you out. That no longer made sense that a loving God would do that. And, and it wasn't, 
and, and, and another Bible verse that kept coming to my mind, for those of you who aren't Christians who are listening to this, there is a Bible verse in the New Testament that says, all of man's righteousness is as filthy rags to God. And what that is saying is that God doesn't care how good you are, how righteous you are. It's filthy rags to him. He only wants his ego appeased. He only wants you to worship him and have faith in him. You can't work your way into heaven. All your good works not going to do you a damn bit of good because he's going to throw you in hell no matter how good you are. And I kept thinking, all of these wonderful, beautiful people who love their children, who work at Special Olympics, who, who are just, they, they, they never lie. They don't do, they're good people. He is going to burn them because all their whole life's effort is filthy rags to him. And that I, that just, no, I kept saying, no, how you live your life matters. And once I started thinking on that, I thought to myself, okay, you can be a pedophile priest and you can literally brutally rape young children, brutally rape them, but you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you and his blood covers every rape, every molesting. Even if you murder a child, the blood of Jesus covers you and forgives you. And you're going to go to heaven. And it's going to be wonderful. And you're going to have your own cloud, you pedophile priest. You, you're forgiven. And a very good Hindu man who loved his family, who fed the sick, clothed the naked, was truthful every day, tried to be good, he's going to be burning in hell. The pedophile priest is in heaven. The good, good Hindu man is burning in hell. At some point, I let go. It was like free fall. It was literally like jumping into the Grand Canyon. I let go. I let go of that dark, hateful God. And the other thing that kind of got to me during that time too, think about it, I'm very pro-life. And I started thinking about Passover. Passover was when God, Yahweh, got mad at Pharaoh. And he said, I'm going to teach you a lesson, Pharaoh. I'm going to get you. And he slaughters thousands of firstborn Egyptian children infanticide. The Christian God is the God of infanticide. You worship people, a God of infanticide. He told the Hebrews, you can slaughter the Hittites, slaughter the children, slaughter the old women, slaughter everyone. Oh, you can keep the virgins, but everyone else you kill. I let go of that God of infanticide, genocide. It, it, it's a God of human sacrifice. Christianity is based on human sacrifice. It's mm. based on that. As if human sacrifice, taking your child, your son, and having them sadistically nailed to a cross is a good thing. Really a good thing. I let go of it. I free fell into the Grand Canyon of being an agnostic. And about that time, I read Marianne Williamson's book, A Return to Love, which kind of became my Bible of sorts. But her book just talks about what it means to have love be your guide, have love be your religion. And that was in, mm, my, that was probably around 2000. And so for the next 21 years, I have been your friendly agnostic. Hmm. It, going back just a second to your thought about the infanticide, it's really interesting. Two thoughts on um, the first one that in the first example you used about Egypt. In that story, it even says that Pharaoh had already told them that they could go and leave and that it was God who had specifically hardened their heart, his heart of Pharaoh. So God had already said, made a way for it to be over which is amazing. 
And, and Tim, here's the other amazing thing. This was infanticide. And historians writing about that actually say the blood of the innocents ran red down the streets. There was so much gore from killing these firstborn children that the blood ran red down the streets. How can a church celebrate the slaughter of innocent children? They call it Passover and they celebrate the slaughter of innocent children. How is that even possible? Yeah, uh, it's another entire entire nation's holiday. Holiday, it's, it's, it's and the Christ, Christians celebrate it too. Yeah. Now, the of uh, the other interesting thing during this process of coming out deconversion was the story, and because I have this thing about children, unborn children, children, the um, the the story of Abraham and Isaac. So God is feeling insecure. Does Abe really love me? I don't know. I'm feeling insecure. So what does he do to state his insecurity? He gets a bright idea. I know what I can do. I can tell Abraham to slaughter Isaac. And then I'll see if he really loves me more than Isaac. So he takes God tells him, you need to prove your love to me. Take Isaac, put him on an altar. And Abraham says, I'll do it. I'll do it. So he takes him and he puts him on an altar as if this is a good thing. This is like you, you saying to your wife, Tim, wife, I don't know if you still love me. Please take our child who's 10 years old into the garage and cut his throat. And then I'll know, wife, if you really love me. Now take him now. Here's the butcher knife. Take him into the garage and slit his throat. You would go to a mental institution. You would be arrested as a psychopath. And you would be in a mental institution for a God to ask one of his children to slit the throat of his own child is a psychopath, a psychopath. And it's interesting too, when you look at the cultural dynamics of what was going on there, you have other nations who are doing child sacrifice. And so in, and obviously there's more to that history than, than we're going to go into here, but just in terms of what the Bible describes it as is, is, is that Israel was supposedly not doing any child sacrifice and all the other pagan nations supposedly were. And so you'd think, okay, if, if this God really wants to say, I am so holy and so different. So the one, the one main way that I'm going to make myself radically different from all these other pagan nations that love to sacrifice their kids is I'm going to tell you, please go sacrifice your kid. Like, yes. come on, that doesn't make sense. He's no, he's, no, no. He's separate. Yeah. He would never and, do that. And- And Tim, along those lines, if he was going to uh, have a demarcation between him and those people who did sacrifice children, Passover, the slaughter of the firstborn, was 100% child sacrifice to that God. That God sacrificed thousands of children as many probably as those other nations who did child sacrifice. This was the ultimate child sacrifice. Thousands at one swoop. No other God, pagan God, had perfected child sacrifice the way that Yahweh had. He had it under control. It's interesting that when you're looking at child sacrifice too, number one, there's some just some one-off weird things that happen in the text where uh, I think it's you know in the Psalms, uh, David or Solomon or, or somebody says something like, "Blessed are those of you who dash your yes. enemies' babies' heads against yes. the rocks." Yes. These imprec- imprecatory, like I, I hope, like I hope God gets you. I hope God gets you so yes. bad that He literally dashes your kids' heads open on the rocks. I mean, yes, this is some really nasty stuff. And yes, good. And Tim, along these lines of this very brutal, sadistic God, 
And people like to separate him from Jesus. Oh, that's not, that's not, they'll tell me, that's not my Jesus. Folks, this is what you call the Trinity, and they are one. Jesus is Yahweh. All of those things that Yahweh did, as hard as this is to conceptualize, Jesus did. And Jesus was okay with it. People, he never denounced any of this infanticide or genocide. He never denounced Yahweh. And in the Christian mindset, he was Yahweh. Mm. He was Yahweh. Yeah. They yeah. can't, pro, yeah, progressive Christianity or a, a Christianity that likes to separate the Yahweh character from the Jesus character it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make it any better. No, it, it doesn't make it better. And then, and then the other thing, as far as the child sacrifice goes, uh, this is maybe the most dastardly. I don't know. It says also Yahweh slash Jesus slash Holy Ghost say in their law, okay, Israel, okay, Hebrews, if um, you have a child that's unruly, this is what I want you to do with them. I want you to take them to the edge of the field and elders in the village, I want you to pick up stones and I want you to throw stones at that child until he is dead. Now, I would like to ask you, Tim, what does it do to the soul of a man, a father, to go to an edge of a field and to pick up rocks and throw them at an unruly child until that child dies, throw them and hit the head of the child, watch the child crumble. What does that do to the, that wicked God, Yahweh, actually told his people to take stones to a child and stone them to death, to mm. death. And all of the zeitgeist of these Christians, I don't care if you're progressive, if you're liberal or you're fundamentalist, that God was wicked, dark, twisted, evil. And for you to worship that God and call that God good is a travesty to truth. Yeah. And it, just to continue that line of thinking one step further, one of the big issues that comes up as well as this whole idea of, of blood magic, um, blood sacrifice, and the idea of why does God have to require blood, meaning whether... In the Old Testament, he's requiring the blood of a, a sheep or a goat, um, some kind of animal to kind of cover you temporarily until Christ comes as the, as the final perfect sacrifice once and for all. And then Jesus, why does his blood have to be shed? And it's almost like there's this sense. I don't, I don't know if you did you ever read the Narnia Chronicles from years ago? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have this story in there of of this Aslan character, who's the Christ character, and he is killed and sacrificed on this stone table. And of course, you know, some of the people that observe it are, are horrified to see that he is killed and they didn't think he could really die probably. But all of a sudden the stone table cracks and he comes back to life and they're like, what happened? We saw you, you were dead. And he says, well, there, there was this magic from before the dawn of time. And the magic said, like the rules of the magic said, if someone that's, you know, a perfect sacrifice dies for someone else who's, who's guilty, um, then in that case, the stone table will crack and the person will come back to life. And you, you get this beautiful sense of, as you're a Christian, like, oh, that's the story of Jesus. Beautiful. It's the gospel. But then you're like, wait a second. If God's in charge and there's no other God, there's no one higher than God, then, then whoever wrote the magic from before the dawn of time is also God. So if God wrote this, God is saying, I require blood. Why? Like, why does God need blood? Why can't he just say the words, I forgive you? You, you know, especially knowing that he created us supposedly um, flaw, you know, full of flaws. He created us with a garden where he knew certainly had prescience that within a couple of days or sooner, we'd probably fall into sin, especially with the enemy of our souls being allowed to be in the garden. Like he knew that we were so weak that we would fall prey to sin that we would. And if it hadn't been Adam and Eve, it would have been their kids. Somebody would have fallen into sin very quickly and we would have all been condemned right from the start. And yet 
God can't just say, I forgive you. And, and the idea that strikes me a lot is Christians don't see that this group that came, uh, you know, that, that, you know, that was early Israel, they came out of Egypt, not as, not as people that had gone to Egypt and came out, but they were Egyptian. If you look at the history carefully, they were Egyptians that came out and the Egyptians were neck deep and steeped in blood magic and circumcision. They would believe that if you, if you did blood magic sacrifice, you would have atonement and you would have, appease your God. And the other big thing was they, they made it really clear that we stand out by cutting off the end of our little boy's penises. Well, you get this group that goes up to Israel and what do they do? It's all about blood magic and circumcision. It's the same thing. And it just, it shocks me that they don't look at both the philosophical issue of this doesn't make sense. Why can't God just say, I forgive you? But also, where is this even coming from? And then you look at the evolution of the Yahweh character, where originally it wasn't Yahweh. And I know you know all this stuff. I'm just saying this for our audience. But Yahweh originally was the son of a, of a bigger God named Elyon. And Elyon had a wife named Asherah. And then eventually it switched and Yahweh and, and Elyon got merged. And now Yahweh is married to Asherah. And then eventually Asherah gets removed from the story. And now it's just Yahweh. But it keeps on evolving. And there's scriptures right in there where you can tell that the, that the earlier stages of this story are still hard to mask. Like there's a part where um, the Yahweh character is not considered the all-powerful God. He's considered a regional God. And so there's certain circumstances where he just can't win. Like there's one, I always get a chuckle out of it. It says that, you know, God sent his people to so, such and such a place to fight. And it says, but they had iron chariots, so they couldn't win. So it's like this idea of your, your regional God is fighting another regional people or another regional God. And if the, if their, if their God has given them something better, you know, better chariots or something where he's protecting them more, you're not necessarily going to win because you, you've got this Yahweh character. That's not the God. Um, and certainly you see it with even Genesis one, you know, let us, or um, let us make man in our own, in our own image, this divine council of, of, you know, the higher God and the demigods all chatting about how they're going to proceed with, with creating things. And eventually you get to a point where you just say, do you all not realize this is mythology? I mean, do you, when you talk to people, do you ever get to that kind of topic? And do, do you ever find people willing to even address it that way? No, because I usually just realize that people's eyes glaze over. So I try to stick with something that is not about canon or inerrancy or anything else. I stick to the sadistic nature of a God that would have hell. And what I do there is I say, I would like I'm talking to a Christian, like you're a Christian. Tim, I want to tell you something that I know to be true. Tim, if your God is real and he really does have in the universe a pit of napalm, that has burning human beings in it. I promise you, Tim, that the forces of good in the universe are going to find your sadistic God and they're gonna find his pit of human beings that are burning and burning. And the forces of good in the universe, Tim, they are gonna defeat your God and they are gonna set those captives free. And Tim, whose side are you gonna be on? Tim, are you going to be going, no, no, keep them in hell. They didn't accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Keep them burning. Is that what you're going to say, Tim? Or are you going to be glad that they have defeated your God and set the captives free? Because I guarantee you, you're going to have friends in that pit of hell. You may even have children or grandchildren in that pit of hell. And are you going to tell me right now, look me in the eye, Tim, and tell me that you want them to remain burning and you do not want the forces of good to let them out and they just look at me like what did she just do to me i totally agree and, and one of the other issues that comes up with this as well as um just the idea of of christians being okay then living their lives knowing that that is in their minds actively happening like it's it's just a cliche that people christians will um will go out to dinner, for example, after church. Just a lot of people do it, which is funny because a lot of Christians be like, no, no, don't, don't work. Don't work on the, on the Sunday, on the Sabbath. But then they will, um, they will 
want other people to work to serve them their their you know their uh, lunchtime meal at uh, you know at a steakhouse or something. So they'll go out, and I'm just thinking. So you just heard this great sermon. You know, if, if you're you know a good Baptist, you heard of hellfire mixed in there. Yes, the love of God, but if you don't receive the love of God, like you said, you're going to burn for it. And and now you're out eating your your food, eating your steak and potatoes, eating your nice chicken dinner with your family, smiling away, beautiful sunshiny day, knowing that at that moment, as you're enjoying your life, there are people absolutely screaming in pain. And it's like, if, if you really believed it, if you really believed it, you would be telling every server and every other diner in that restaurant that they need to be saved if you really believed it. Yeah. But you feel guilty for doing anything personal, like watching a TV show. If you really love some comedy show, yeah, I feel like that's, would, that was yeah. 30 minutes I could have used yeah. to yeah. either share yes. the gospel or get ready to share the gospel. Yes. Now, the other thing that um, before this ends that I really want to get out there yeah, take a... is that when you going back to the blood magic and how this whole thing came to being back to the beginning this god yahweh set up a reality game he set up a reality show a video game if you will called earth and kind of like the uh gladiators back in the roman coliseums he set this thing up when he set it up, he created Satan. He knew Satan would fall. He, God, Yahweh, in his mind, everything emanates from him. From the mind of Yahweh came pedophilia, war, hunger, starvation, child trafficking. From his mind came everything. From his mind, he created Satan and put all these ideas into Satan's mind. Why did he do this? He did it for one reason. He set up earth so that he could call or ferret out syncophants who would worship him no matter how dark or evil he was. He wanted, he even calls them sheep. Sheep are mindless. He wanted syncophants, mindless sheep to worship him. He was willing to have child trafficking. He was willing to have pedophiles rape children. He was willing to have whole nations. He was willing to have mothers hold babies who, who were starving sticks the Holocaust, he was willing to create all of this evil, pain and suffering so he could find a syncophant that would worship him. No matter how dark he was, they would worship me. And what are they going to do in heaven? Because this God is pure, throbbing ego, they're going to sing his praises every minute, every day. He's looking for mindless sheep. He's a throbbing ego. And they're just going to go, hail, hallelujah. Hey, that he set up all of this pain, all of this agony, all of this torture to find the mindless sheep who will worship him. Now, to your point of the magic and the sacrifice, he could have find, found these sheep a million different ways, but he chose to make this Colosseum where he looks down and sees children being raped and trafficked, mothers holding starving babies. And just like with Job and, and all of that, he just smiles and goes, this is my way of finding my sheep. Who will worship me? <laughs> I mean, yeah, evil. And the the reality, evil. yeah, it's it's crazy. And the reality is, Christians won't admit that. They just they refuse to admit it. They refuse. they refuse to to see it as it is. And and stepping back, we're we're talking about it in a sense as if we're saying this God is is wicked. This God, you know, almost as if we were talking to him like God, you're wicked. God, you're. Of course, I'm not going to bow down to you. 
But what we're really talking about is is not God, because there, there's this this God is made up. But what we're talking about is a man-made system, and it it amazes me too that no matter what the dynamics have been, you know, we if if history had been a little bit different, we would all be worshiping Mithras, and we'd be arguing about whether Mithras is real. But just the luck of the draw, the way the chips fell, it's it was Jesus. But you're talking about a system, a system that number one evolved. It evolved heavily from Egyptian and Sumerian influences uh, up to um, the, the different influences when Israel got taken away by the um, ba Babylonians, by the Greeks, you know, the Romans, all that influence that just was so heavy. You see it. I mean, you see it even in, in, in the New Testament. They use words about being thrown into Tartarus and Hades, which are Greek, Greek mythological places, um, very much, you know, fire and brimstone. Um, the, the being a progressive Christian doesn't fix that. The, you know, the Hades no. and Tartarus were very clearly places no. of extreme torture. No. But then you have progressive Christian does not fix that. No, yeah, it doesn't fix anything. I mean, no. it's it's just to me, it's the last stop, the train stop before yeah. you get to the it's final just, one, which is yeah. <laughs> which is atheist. But you know, if it helps people get through it, that's fine. I, yeah. I know it's it's yeah. jarring to leave Christianity, but what I mean to say is is what you're talking about is basically men, mostly men, very rarely women, but mostly men. And arguably, because of what you just talked about with all the torturous ideas, bad men, bad men who wrote it, bad men who continued it, who passed it down, bad men who adjusted it, bad men who edited it and altered it and said these books are in, these books are out, bad men who couldn't say stuff like, we shouldn't be owning people, we shouldn't be stoning people, we shouldn't be stealing people's land, bad men, horrible men. And then we now, 2,000 years later, feel somehow obligated to take these these very bad men's who, who are long dead. I mean, they, they don't care. They're dead. They're not, you know, they're not in heaven or hell or anywhere. They're just, they're dust. But these men that have absolutely no power over us technically, these men, we act as if they have so much power over our lives. And even if I'm not, I don't believe in any kind of spirituality of any kind. I don't believe in any either. kind of power or anything, but even if people wanted to believe that, which is, you know, people's preference, um, why would you go to a book like this for the dynamics? Like the people that say, oh, I want to be spiritual and I just take the love parts or this part. Like why go to a book like this that has absolutely horrific ideas in it? And it, I mean, it's kind of like if to me, it, it's like if you were like, well, um, you, know, you know, Hitler wrote Mein Kampf. Yeah, that, no, that is exactly what it is. Yeah. And there might be some I've never read it. I, I'm just no, thinking but, but, that, here, but there might be an occasional good sentence here or there in that book yeah. where something sounds loving yeah. or, or healthy. Yeah. Like, yeah, but but it's it's Mein Kampf, people. It's Mein Kampf. Yeah, it's sanitizing something that is not sanitizable. Yes. That's what it's doing. Exactly. It is whitewashing something that cannot be whitewashed. And when those liberal Christians and the progressive Christians, they all have the Bible on their altars or they all have the Bible in their home. People, that Bible in the New Testament says, Slaves, obey your masters. It is in the New Testament. Your Testament says, I suffer not a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Th this is um, pro-slavery. It is misogynistic. It is sadistic with your God uh, who is going to burn people for all eternity it is exactly like taking Mein Kampf and trying to have it on the altar of your church, in your home, teaching your children from it and saying, I know there's bad parts in it. I, I know they want to kill Jews, but, but Hitler really made our economy great. And National Socialism, oh my gosh, you should have seen what it did for our country. You can't whitewash evil. You yeah. cannot do it. But that is what they all want to do. And it it's mind boggling. It's yeah. just it is. And the last thing I, I want to mention too, and I'll pass the ball to you to, to to tell us more of your story. But one of the parts that amazes me is that Christians don't seem to care where it even came from. And I don't mean the generic, like, well, we know it got passed down. We know there were church councils that established the canon, but I mean very specifically. Where did this come from? And if you've watched any of my, any of my videos, you, you know where I'm going with this. But th just the idea of if you told a Christian, for example, do you realize when you're when you're reading the New Testament that it quotes the book of Enoch at least 100 times? It's like, nah. 
Yes, it quotes the Book of Enoch a hundred times. It quotes Jubilees dozens of times, Maccabees over and over. It quotes um, all kinds of stuff from the Greek philosophers, from Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, even refers to uh, Aesop in one of the stories. You're like, wait a second, there's more to this. There's more to this. You know, Jesus quoting from the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, a lot of influence from Pythagoras. Um, I know of a few. I'm trying to dig into the rest of them, but you know, John 21 with 153 fish, exactly 153. That's a Pythagorean magic number. Um, Luke 1 and 2 with all the numbers around there. Revelation is Pythagoras on steroids. Just so much Pythagorean stuff. And then you you mix in all these other books, lots of stuff from Plutarch, lots of quotes from Josephus. And even just the generics, even if people didn't look at the copy, where it's copying from, but just knowing there were like 40 or 50 gospels at least why did they land it on four? What, what, what happened to their 40 or 50? There was at least six different books of Acts. All these books, and yet we, we're going to trust that some men, which we arguably could say are bad men, some really bad men said, these four Gospels, this one book of Acts, and these epistles are our New Testament. We don't know who they were. We don't know anything about them. We don't know their personal lives, who they were stealing from and you know having affairs with. Like We don't know anything about who they were hurting, who they were beating. We just, we just assume the best that these were good men who made the choices from God to say, these are your books from the Lord. And it's like, why? Why would you trust men from 2,000 years ago that you don't even know their names, let alone what they stood for in their lives, and they're going to dominate your spirituality? It's insane to me that Christians would pretty much, and I, I'm including myself in this, so I, I say this to my shame, Christians either would have to say, I don't know, and that's why I'd say, you should know, you, you better know, this is what you're worshiping, you should know this. Or they'd say, I just don't care. I know that God, I know that God preserved his word. He gave us what he wanted and he preserved it. So why would I fuss about where it came from? I know what I've got is from God. And it's like, no, you don't know. You don't know. You're just assuming. And it's like this whole religion is based on people assuming, assuming that it's from God, assuming that these men spoke for God, assuming that the canon's correct, assuming all these things. And like, you're assuming your whole life away. You don't know anything about where this came from. It's crazy to me. Tim, you were brought up in the faith and you're curious and you're intellectual and people, general population are none of those. They truly don't care about the things you and I care about. They don't care that these books came from here, there, or yonder because these books were inspired by God. And Tim, you can tell me all this crap you want, but I know my Bible was inspired by God and the Holy Spirit. And my God picked the right books and the right authors to put. And so all your stuff, keep it because my Bible was inspired by God. And so that is why I have found when talking to people, that the, the esoteric stuff that fascinates you and me, they don't care about. They do not care. They don't care about the myths. They don't care about the blood magic. It makes their eyes gloss over. But what does, I have found, because I've talked to hundreds of people at this point, what, what I have found, the only thing that can happen is that thing where you say, you have your God, you have hell, you have children, grandchildren, friends, they're burning, and the forces of good come, whose side are you going to be on? That is the only thing that I have found stops them in their tracks, because it is, Tim, a terrifying thing to say, I would be on God's side, I, my God's side, I would keep them burning hmm. when the forces of good come i would keep my daughter my neighbor my mother i would keep them in hell because the blood of jesus does not cover their sins for a human being to say that it's hard it's hard because you you with the with the general population you have to get it to a place that they can relate to. It's hard for them to relate to the things we love, the mm. history, the blood magic, the paganism that seeps in. It's hard for them even to get to your Bible. It okays slavery. 
It okays misogyny. A woman has to, they can't even go there because they can gloss that over too. Well, we, we don't, our church doesn't, no, we don't believe, but they can't gloss over what would you do on that day? The forces of good, the Star Trek people have come and found your God. Whose side are you on? Mm -hmm. That is a bottom line that is very hard to wiggle out of. Yeah. And it, it's interesting you, you bring up a point too with the idea of letting people out of hell. <clears throat> it makes you wonder if, if God said to people who were in heaven and he said to them, this is being totally making this up. But if God were to say, I put people in hell, you know, eternity is over, like time's over. It's, we're all in eternity. Earth is gone. Um, those of you who are in heaven are going to be there forever. Those in hell are there forever. But I would prefer to leave it that way. I'd prefer that the people in hell stay there because they deserve it. They didn't trust me. They didn't accept my perfect sacrifice. But those of you in heaven, you know, I'm going to pick, pick somebody and I'm going to say to you, you know, I, you know, Nancy, you, you're in heaven now. I'm going to give you a choice. If you want to let some of your closest friends and family out, I'm going to give you a choice. Like say, I'll give you, give you a choice of 20, 20 people. Yeah, yeah. You can let them out. And God's kind of giving you a mixed message where he says, I'm just telling you, they don't deserve it. And my preference would be that they burn because my holiness deserves its satisfaction. But because of my love for you, I'm going to give you this extreme chance. I'm going to let I'm going to let you have 20 people go out if you want to. And so now you, as this human in heaven, glorifying God, and, and now perfectly understanding his white-hot holiness and how beautiful it is, you are now in a conundrum because you are obviously in your humanity wanting so much to take them out of torture. And yet you're wanting to honor God and say, God, I understand that if, if, if I obey, if I, if I take this to its extreme yeah. and say, you can come out those of yeah. you who are in hell you're kind of dissing god and saying god i know your holiness is important but it's not that important it's not it's a, it, i like i want to honor it but not that much and, and i don't know if you realize how you have stumbled on something that is extremely profound and why anti-christianity is my main passion because that crucible that you're talking about where a human being is faced with the decision, do I stick with my bestie God and please him by saying, keep them burning? Or do I go in my humanity and let them out? What we can clearly see is that your humanity trumps your God's humanity. Your God does not have humanity. Your God is a psychopath and you can appease his psychopathic nature or you can go with your human nature, which is finer, better, more righteous than this God. And the sad truth is that Christianity has the potential to darken a human soul to the point that it aligns with a psychopath and not with its true goodness. It mm. aligns with a psychopath. And when you have the biggest or one of the, no, the biggest religion of the whole earth with a zeitgeist that aligns with a dark, twisted psychopath, the whole earth suffers, the whole earth groans with the darkness that a psychopath has covered us. Mm. One of the examples of how this manifests itself is I had a friend and she was a born again, born again. And I said to her, she's passed away now so i don't want to use her name but let's call her betty i said betty what if your daughter annie missed heaven and she annie ends up in hell and betty you're in heaven and you know that annie's burning in hell she's suffering 
I want to know, Annie, at what point do you go to your Jesus? And at what point do you say, Annie's been in there a hundred years, Jesus, please let her out. Or is it going to be a thousand years? Annie's been burning for a thousand years, please let her out. And, and Betty looked at me and her eyes were very cold. And she said, Annie heard the gospel and she rejected it. And I felt I was looking into the eyes of evil. I felt her cold eyes that would allow a mother to say, Annie heard the gospel and rejected it. And she deserves to be tormented for all eternity. That perhaps, I worked in a prison for 10 years. That was perhaps my closest brush with pure evil was a mother saying that her child deserved to burn in hell because the child had rejected the gospel. It was working with rapists, with murderers, with carjackers, with drug dealers. That was the moment I truly felt evil. Hmm. That's a great point. And that Another way to put it would be to say, if you believe in monstrous ideas long enough, you kind of become a monster. And, and that is and that is why we were able to napalm Vietnam. But God is going to God's going to napalm them for all eternity. So what the hell? That is why we were able to do Hiroshima and Nagasaki. God's going to Nagasaki them for all eternity. This is why we're able to bomb other countries, America, with impunity, why we can destroy them, because God's going to do much worse than that. This whole zeitgeist of Christianity has infected our souls. Our very souls are infected with the psychopathic, sadistic God. Hmm, it's true. Well, I, I wanted to make sure I left a little bit of time at the end here, too, as well, to ask you about, I guess you call it the aftermath what happened after you, uh, well, well, let me ask this, what, what were the final stages, the final you know, weeks and days before you were able to verbalize that you didn't believe anymore? Was that, I assume, excruciating? Um, but what were the final weeks and days like before you could verbalize that to yourself? And then could you tell us about what happened? It had, been, next... coming, it had been coming on with the man who was under the bench who told me about God being love and not in the churches. And when the devil came out of the gates of Planned Parenthood and walked over to me and showed me love and the Christian showed me hate. Hmm. And then the Bible verse about all of man's righteousness is as filthy rags. And then I left this out too, which is kind of important in the Old Testament over 20 times it says that Yahweh enjoys the aroma of burning flesh over 20 times and I thought to myself um maybe that's why he has hell so he has all these human logs that are burning flesh that he can delight in it says over 20 times, Yahweh delights in the aroma of burning flesh. Like what kind of God delights in the aroma of burning flesh? But it was all of these little things. And it wasn't like, hmm, but it was just like they all added up until I found myself fought free falling in the Grand Canyon. Hmm. And then the parachute was... Marianne Williamson's A Return to Love, because it gave me something to believe in, because it was a void. What do I believe? I felt like, who am I? I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a New Ager. At that time, I wasn't a anything. And Marianne Williamson gave me the religion of love, the religion of the golden rule, the religion of just be a good person, be kind. What if we close the churches and every Sunday morning we devoted from nine o'clock until noon doing good works, going to a soup kitchen, picking up the litter in a poor neighborhood, going to somebody on our block who we know is a shut-in and making them a peanut butter or jelly sandwich. 
What if the whole earth on Sunday morning started doing tangible good works? Whoa, yeah, whoa. Instead, they sit in churches and they read verses for the millionth time and they pick out the sentence. Did you see the comma there in first time? I never noticed there was a comma there. I wonder what the comma means. Oh my gosh, in the meantime, the hungry are still hungry. The naked are still naked. The prisoners are not being visited. Oh, the comma. Let's go back to the comma, please. The comma. I mean, come on, people. Yeah. Come on. I mean, what was it like in terms of your, just your, not, not your public life, but just your, your, when you're alone, thinking, you know, stuff at night, just kind of in the quietness of your own heart, wondering realizing that, that this whole picture of heaven and certainly hell aren't real. Did... I felt liberated. I felt like I was a captive that was set free. Hmm. I felt joy. I felt that I understood better why the earth was so messed up, which I didn't understand before. And I, I would say I felt cleaner as a human. I just felt cleaner. And one thing about working in the prison that also I would like to say, so here I am a decade in a prison with male felons, bad guys, gangsters, thugs, punks, da da da. At their core, I learned in the prison that human beings are good. These were not bad, evil, fallen, carnal, creatures. These were little boys who had not been parented. These were little boys who had been abused as little boys. These were little boys that grew up in poverty and that had three children at age 19, a sick auntie, a sick grandma, and they needed to support them. They couldn't read, blah, blah, blah. These were, these were little boys who lost their way. And yes, they did bad things. Yes, they did terrible things. But if you went back and you heard their stories and you saw their hearts, I would, these guys, even somebody who was, now this was back in the day because I've been re retired for a while, but um, so this was maybe 10 years ago. I would say to them, and the, the low end of drug dealers could probably make 100000 in a year on a street corner, and that's the low end. So we're talking a lot of money. And I would say to them, how much money would you have to make per year if I could get you to be an electrician, if I could get you to be a union welder, a union plumber, how much would you have to make per year that you would say, Miss Simpson, I will never go back. And they they all said about 45, 40 to 45. Be and if I could have made these men plumbers, electricians, mechanics, they would have gotten on their knees and kissed my feet because they know when they go back out, they have no ability to get a job. They can barely read. They've got three felonies, two gun charges, three, four children, three, four baby mamas, a sick auntie, a sick mother that all look to them for support. So we all know they're going back to crime. You would go back to crime. I would go back to crime. We can't read. No one's going to hire us with gun charges and felonies. There's no place for them in our society. So we, we, we know all this is true about them. And we, and yet they, at their core, they want to do good. They want to be like you and me, but they're cut out of the pie. Mm -hmm. And so what I learned in the prison was good people. People are born with good hearts. Even the bad guys who do bad things, given a chance, they want to be good. Unless you have a mental illness of some sort where you're truly a psychopath, Jeffrey Dahmer eating people, the regular bread and butter felon, they would like many of them, most, most all of them that I met, which was hundreds if not thousands over a decade, they want to do good. They're just cut out of the pie. Mm.
breaks your heart. They're not think evil. About. They're not fallen. They're not. They're the more evil. I felt in the eyes of the mother who told me her child deserved hell. That I did not feel evil in that sense from these men. I felt they had lost their way on their journey due to circumstances of mostly poverty, lack of parenting, and childhood abuse. Well, I wanted to make sure I left a, a moment too for you to kind of wrap this up with um, two things. Number one, I wanted to ask you if there's anything I didn't ask you about that you wanted to talk about to address that and bring it up. But also, um, could you then also, for anyone that might be on the on the beginning of a journey that's you know similar to yours, where they have begun to question that they're not necessarily out by any stretch. They're just saying, I hear you, you're making some good points, but I, I've got some answers to it. I feel like I could answer a lot of your objections, blah, blah, blah. But some of the stuff is starting to, you know, hit home and I am doing some serious investigation. And they're, they're for the first point, giving themselves that freedom to say, I'm not saying I'm going to be an atheist or an agnostic by any stretch, probably not. But I am saying some of this stuff doesn't add up anymore. Some of this stuff sounds wrong. I, I don't know where this goes, but I think I need to change my perspective, my worldview on some things. And I'm not sure where to get started. What would you say would be a good way for someone who's just starting to explore this without certainly, you know, you can go to hundreds of different YouTube channels and so forth, but some of it go, they go very deep, very fast where you're known you're into ultra atheism. Um, other places are, are, are more into, you know, quasi spirituality. Like let's just, you know, love Jesus and talk about the good parts of the Bible where there's just, there's such a span of, of different venues you could go to. And it can be confusing, I think, to people as to what what what's the best place to start. And so my question is, what what would you recommend people begin to research and think about if they're on this journey at the sort of at the beginning phase of it? In the beginning phase of it, people still need a God because you don't just ditch or dump God. So I would say in the beginning, percolate on God is love percolate on God is love and percolate on how could a loving God have a burning pit of hell with humanity in it. It percolate on that percolate on a loving God. And then I would say, I love you and you are not hearing these words by chance. There's a reason uh, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. So these words and ideas, don't let them scare you, but let them spurn you on to a God of love and humans. I see you don't want to get too deep in the beginning. Like I could go on and on and on, but you just want to, and I would probably give them Marianne Williamson's A Return to Love. Another really good one in the beginning is Embrace by the Light by Betty Eady. Those are books that for the baby that take you from that uh, fundamentalistic way of thinking of Christianity and broadening it to that God, not so much, but the God of love. Hmm. Embrace by the Light, Marianne Williamson, A Return to Love, but you can't See, I want to do my big dump, but you can't. Their eyes glaze over. You just can't. So mm. I keep it on hell because it's a bottom line for, and when I stumbled on, I didn't even know that there were uh, a whole movement of deconversionists, deconstructionists, a whole movement of Tim's. Who knew? It was only like a year ago I discovered that there was lots of Nancy's out there. I kind of felt alone. And then there you are. And there are all these other podcasts on deconversion, deconstruction. So it is happening person by person. It is truly a movement that is happening. And I would just tell them how much I love them. I would affirm them for being so brave. It's important to affirm people. You're so brave to even think these thoughts. I'm so proud of you. Wow. You know, I would affirm them and whatever baby steps they had taken that got them there, I would say, wow, that you, that is amazing. And really, when you ask me this, now that I've had a chance to crystallize it, whatever it was that took them to their questioning point, 
I think for everybody, it should be hell, but it's not. For some people, it's the canon. I'm always amazed that for how many people it's evolution. I'm like, evolution, it doesn't even come into my uh, playbook. But many people, that is what evolution got them out or the inerrancy of the word of God. Whatever that kernel is, that that person, the wedge, I would go to their wedge. My wedge is hell. Yours might be blood magic. Somebody else's might be evolution. I think it's important that you find their crack, whatever it might be. If it's the canon, if it's inerrancy, if it's misogyny, whatever the crack is that they started, because I want to blast my hell on to every, it's not everybody's crack. It's not everybody's kernel. Whatever their kernel of truth is that is cracking them away from their paradigm, we need to find that truth, not our truth, be it blood magic, be it pagan origins, can't, whatever it is, and then emphasize and build on their crack, not your crack. Because hmm. they might not even be interested in your crack. It might be nothing to them. Find their crack and build on it. It's amazing the, the idea of like the makes me think of like when your a door cracks open, sometimes, you know, when you're a little kid, you can't push the really big doors, you know, at, at some kind of big building and you need an adult to kind of help you. But often when an adult just kind of helps you get the momentum, you can kind of keep, keep, keep going. And often it, or it's like dominoes, you know, you, you, you can't, yeah. if you're far, very far away from them and they're, they're all stacked up, you can kick all you want, but they're not going to fall down. But as you take just baby steps toward it, Eventually, you, you've yes. come close enough to make that one last kick and yeah. it does fall. Well, yeah. Was there anything else I didn't ask you about that? Uh, no, we, you were great and we were great. The dynamic duo, Tim awesome. and Nancy, the dynamic duo. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate your your story. It sounds like you've been through uh, a lot of stuff. As often as I hear from a lot of people, there's just a whole bunch of uh, ups and downs of, of stories. And I'm sure there's some things we didn't get to touch on, but you've obviously poured out your heart and, and, and not just in this interview, but just in your life in terms of just going through the the journey um, and what a journey it sounds like it's been. And I just, I want to say this, I appreciate, of course, your bravery to, to do what you did in all those um, parts of the journey, but also to speak up now. And I, I know that um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll throw one more question in. I know you've talked about wanting to eventually start to uh, create your own podcast and talk about your story. And I'm just curious, could you give us, even if it's not going to be ready for a while, could you give us a little preview of what you might end up doing uh, if that happens? I would like to do exactly what you're doing. I would like to interview people, not just my story, but I would like to interview exactly like you do other people and hear their deconversion stories. And what was it? What was your touchstone of recovery? What was it that cracked open the um, falsehoods of the paradigm of Christianity. And because I find, like I'm sure you do, other people's stories are fascinating and they're all different and everyone's coming at it from different angles. So I would like to do you, I would like to interview people who have come out of it and are on the other side. Hmm. I just want to say again, thank you. I, whenever you do get to the... Um point where you're you're do you have the, the podcast i'll definitely uh get the link and put it in our video i'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with and uh just thank you again this has been great to hear your story i hope hope your platform in this gets bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger because people need to hear this this is this is a, a way of reclaiming your life i know we didn't talk too much about that but it's you're reclaiming your identity reclaiming your life you're clearing your mind for the first time you're getting mythology out and putting a lot of good stuff in what a what a great way to live your life and to make a difference for this planet and um it's just that's the kind of stuff that we need to make this place a, leave it a better place than we found it so thank you so much i love you tim and everyone who's listening to this i love you too thank you so much nancy really thank appreciate you it.